Today's topic is nursing management for clients with chronic kidney disease. Chronic kidney disease involves progressive irreversible loss of kidney function. The Kidney Disease Outcomes Quality Initiative of the National Kidney Foundation defines CKD as either the presence of kidney damage or a decreased GFR less than 60 mL per minute for longer than three months. In-stage kidney disease occurs when the GFR is less than 50 mils, 15 mils per minute. At this point, dialysis or kidney transplant is required to maintain life. 26 million adults live with chronic kidney disease. One in every nine people have CKD. And the mortality rate for patients with in-stage kidney disease is between 19 to 24 percent. The problem is about 70 percent of people with CKD are unaware they live with the disease and the outcomes of not knowing usually when they do seek care there's already been damage done. Common causes are diabetes, hypertension, glomulonephritis, lupus, and then obviously some sort of acute kidney injury. Although CKD has many different causes, the leading causes are diabetes, which is about 50% of the people, hypertension, which is about 25% of the people. Less common causes include glomulonephritis, cystic diseases, and urology diseases. Risk factors for CKD include diabetes, hypertension, greater than 60 years of age, cardiovascular disease, because we know cardiovascular cardiovascular disease can impact renal perfusion, family history of CKD, exposure to some sort of nephrotoxic drugs over time, and if you're African American and Native American you have an increased risk of CKD. There are common stages that are known in CKD, stage 1 to stage 5, Stage 1 of kidney disease involves kidney damage with normal or increased GFR and usually the GFR is equal to, are equal to about 90 uh, mils per minute. Diagnosis and treatment of, CV, of CVD risk reduction and slower progression of the disease would be required at that time. All the way to 5 which is kidney failure with less than 15 mils per minute of GFR and that, that's when dialysis would begin. Although dialysis may begin earlier if patients with chronic kidney disease aren't being managed well with electrolyte imbalances which could cause life-threatening dysrhythmias. Here is a picture of the pathophysiology of CKD. As kidney function deteriorates, less vitamin D is converted to its active form, resulting in decreased serum levels. Activated vitamin D is necessary to optimize absorption of calcium from the GI tract. Thus, low levels of active vitamin D result in decreased serum calcium levels. Normal serum calcium levels are tightly regulated. Also, with releasing calcium from the bones, phosphate is released as well, leading to elevated serum phosphate levels. Hyperphosphatemia also results from decreased phosphate excretion by the kidneys. Hyperphosphate decreases serum calcium levels and further reduces the kidney's ability to activate vitamin D. Low serum calcium, elevated phosphate, and decreased vitamin D contribute to the stimulation of the parathyroid gland and excretion of parathyroid hormone. But the parathyroid hormone acts on the bone to increase remodeling and increase serum calcium levels. The accelerated rate of bone remodeling causes weakened bone matrix and eventually places the patient at higher risk for fractures. Some of the clinical manifestations I've listed here on the PowerPoint slide include metabolic uh, disturbances, which include waste product accumulation, uh, altered carbohydrate metabolism, increased triglycerides. Patients will have hypertension, electrolyte imbalances, in partic particular the two P's, potassium and phosphate. Hyperkalemia will lead to potential dysrhythmias, and decreasing calcium leads to ultimately 
uh, risk for fractures and osteomyelitis and increased phosphate levels also have an impact on patients. Metabolic acidosis, which will then present with um, Kuzmal breathing, which is a con uh, compensatory mechanism for acidosis. So the patient will breathe, try to breathe off the acid by um, basically having um, a, an increased respiratory rate, which blows off CO2. They will also have a decreased urinary output, anemia, bleeding tendencies secondary to platelet dysfunction, cardiovascular disease, dyspnea, which is from the fluid overload, pruritus, which is the uh, itching of the skin, secondary to the excretion of the waste product in um, the pores, uremic frost, which is ure urea crystallization on the skin itself, so it looks like white um, crystals on the skin. Vitamin D cannot convert to activated form, so again you have that loss of calcium and then increased nitrogen, nitrogenous waste, which can cause neuro changes. The progression can be from early signs of CKD, which includes nausea, apathy, weakness, fatigue, and hypertension. Late signs would be frequent vomiting, increasing weakness, lethargy, confusion, restless leg syndrome, paresthesias, which is the numbness and tingling in the extremities, sensory loss, personality changes, Kuzmal breathing and that uremic frost in end stage renal failure. Clinical manifestations related to body systems are the urinary system, and with the urinary system, you can have decreased urinary output. And with the cardiovascular system, you can have hypertension, heart failure, coronary artery disease, pericarditis, and peripheral artery disease. Respiratory complications associated with CKD include pulmonary edema, uremic pleuritis, and pneumonia. The GI system is impacted with anorexia, nausea, vomiting, gastrointestinal bleeding, and gastritis. Hematologically, patients will be anemic, and they will have a higher risk for bleeding incidences and infection. Neurologic conditions affected by CKD are fatigue, headaches, sleep disturbances, and ultimately encephalopathy. Metabolic disturbances include carbohydrate intolerance and hyperlipidemia. Here's a picture of the body systems that are impacted by chronic kidney injury. Diagnostics include a urinalysis, which will show proteinuria, hematuria, and casts. You also have an increased creatinine level, a decreased creatinine clearance, and creat the decreased creatinine clearance will is a diagnostic study where patients will be given a large jug to put their 24-hour uh, urine in. The first urine will be thrown out because, uh, in the morning because it's so concentrated and then the next urine up until the 24-hour mark will be collected in a jug and sent to the lab. A increased BUN level, electrolytes that will be off are hy uh, hyperkalemia. The patient, depending on the disease process um, and where they're at, could be hypernatremic, hyponatremic, or normal. They also will have hyperphosphatemia and hypocalcemia. They'll have a decreased GFR. Their CBC will show a decreased uh, red blood cell count, uh, hematocrit and hemoglobin, which obviously indicates anemia. And then platelets, platelets will also be decreased. There could be a kidney biopsy that rules out cancer or other complications associated with kidneys, an ultrasound to look at kidney enlargement and how it has progressed. Uh, KUB, otherwise known as a kidneys, ureter, and bladder uh, x-ray, will be looked at to see if there's any sort of structural damages, and a CT scan to look at any um, other abnormalities associated with the kidney failure. Main problems associated with CKD are excessive fluid volume, electrolyte imbalances, which could lead to dysrhythmias, uh, ki reduced uh, kidney perfusion, risk for injury, imbalanced nutrition less than body requirements, in particular because there might be a knowledge deficit at what foods to eliminate from the diet secondary to the renal damage, grieving, 
because they're probably at loss for um, independence, fatigue, anemia, and activity intolerance. Interventions should be centered towards these problems. Interventions include managing those um, metabolic disturbances through dialysis, hemo or peritoneal um, dialysis may be an option all the way to ultimately having a kidney transplant. Medication management through diuretics, ACE inhibitors, phosphate binding agents like Selvlamir, uh, which is also called Rinvilla, Kxalate for hyperkalemia, folic acid, iron supplement, and epogen all manage anemia, and then any sort of electrolyte replacement that might be needed secondary to dialysis. Dietary management includes a low sodium, low potassium, and usually a low protein diet. Anemia management is through medications and um, supportive care will be with psychosocial aspects of group support of clients who are living with CKD. There's a great website that I've put here on the PowerPoint slide to talk about diets related to kidney failure. Nursing interventions provide a low protein diet and using supplemental amino acids to support the patient that doesn't have enough protein. Uh, fluid restric restriction, uh, and so fluid restriction, we want to support those patients with maybe using ice chips versus actually drinking um, lots of fluid when they're thirsty. Maybe hard candies to help them moisturize their mouth. Sodium and potassium restriction, and that will be done with diet. Uh, replacement of calcium, replacement of bicarbonate stores to treat acidosis, monitor hypertension and heart failure, and then utilizing hemodialysis to slow the progression of the disease. Prepare client for dialysis or kidney transplant, monitor eyes and nose and vital signs, and lastly provide those rest periods because fatigue is a, a problem with patients with C CKD. Let's talk about the movement of molecules during dialysis because these are important concepts to understand how dialysis works. Dialysis works with um, utilizing diffusion, osmosis, and ultrafiltration. Diffusion is the movement of solutes from an area of greater concentration to an area of lesser concentration. In kidney failure, urea, creatinine, uric acid, and electrolytes, in particular potassium and phosphate, move from the blood to the diacylate with the net effect of lowering their concentration in the blood. Red blood cells, white blood cells, and plasma proteins are too large to diffuse through the pores of the membrane. Small molecular weight substances can pass from the diacylate into a patient's blood, so the purity of the water used for dialysis is monitored and controlled. The other aspect of dialysis is osmosis, which is the movement of fluid from an area of lesser concentration to an area of greater concentration of solutes. Glucose is added to the diacylate and creates an osmotic gradient across the membrane, pulling excess fluid from the blood. Ultrafiltration is the water and fluid removal which results when there is an osmotic gradient or pressure gradient across the membrane. In peritoneal dialysis, excessive fluid is removed by increasing the osmolarity of the diacylate or osmotic gradient with the addition of glucose. In hemodialysis, the gradient is created by increasing pressure in the blood compartment or positive pressure or decreasing pressure in the diacylate compartment or the negative pressure. Extracellular fluid moves into the diacylate because of the pressure gradient. The excessive fluid is removed by creating a pressure differential between the blood and the diacylate solution with a combination of positive pressure in the blood compartment or negative pressure in the dia diacylate compartment. Here is a picture of the AV fistula. AV fistula or arteriovenous fistula uh, is usually placed in a patient who is at the end stage of their renal failure. Usually when the patients are at stage 4 or stage 5 anticipating dialysis. You can see the fistula is really an anastomosis of an artery and a vein put together and this will help with the shunting um, when uh, you are doing dialysis. They'll have one needle that's in the vein and one that's in the artery. 
the thing that you want to remember is to avoid IV starts or blood draws on the side of the fistula and also avoid blood pressures on the fistula side. The key thing for assessing patency of an AV fistula for any patient that's in your care that has a fistula is making sure that you're assessing for patency by feeling for a thrill, which is almost like a... Um, let's see almost like a bubbling it feels underneath the skin when you're touching it and or um, a brewy which is auscultated which is turbulent blood flow sound uh, like a shh, shh sound when you're listening for the patency here's a picture of hemodialysis and you can see how uh, there's two basic needle punctures one needle is in the fistula that takes the blood from the patient uh, into the dialysizer and then it's filtered through uh, using the diacylate and then the blood re is returned that's cleaned into the patient through the secondary needle again the uh, fistula assessment is important for all patients that are in your care that potentially ha have a fistula because patency of that fistula is their lifeline so again placement uh, of the fistula is usually done uh, and then using it takes about three months after its place because it needs time to heal um, so those patients might be having a temporary um, catheter in order to have dialysis if needed Complications of hemodialysis include hypotension, and that's secondary to the rapid removal of vascular volume, decreased cardiac output, decreased systemic vascular resistance. So in that case, if patients do become hypotensive, you will stop the infusion and or slow it down. Uh, muscle cramps is also a secondary complication because of the sh of shifts of phosphate, and then loss of blood, hepatitis, and infection. Peritoneal dialysis is another type of dialysis and it, it's used for chronic treatment of uh, kidney failure, in particular if patients want an alternative method to hemodialysis. Um, in uh, peritoneal dialysis, it's accomplished basically by um, putting dialysis solution into the peritoneal space. There are technically three phases of peritoneal dialysis, the inflow, the dwell, and the drain. The three phases are called an exchange. During inflow, a prescribed amount of solution, usually two liters, is infused through an established catheter, like in this picture, over about 10 minutes. The flow rate may be decreased if the patient has pain. After the solution has been infused, the inflow clamp is closed before air uh, can enter the tube. The next part of the cycle is the dwell time, or equilibrium, during which diffusion and osmosis occur between the patient's blood and the peritoneal cavity. The duration of the dwell time can last from 20 or 30 minutes to 8 hours or more, depending on the method of the peritoneal dialysis. Drain time takes about 15 to 30 minutes and may be facilitated by gently massaging the abdomen or changing positions. The cycle starts again with the infusion of another 2 liters of solution for manual uh, peritoneal dialysis. A period of about 30 to 50 minutes is required to complete an exchange. Dialysis solutions vary and the choice of the exchange volume is primarily determined by the size of the peritoneal cavity. Ultrafiltration or fluid removal during peritoneal dialysis depends on osmotic forces with glucose being the most effective osmotic agent currently available. Dextrose remains the most commonly used osmotic agent in peritoneal dialysis solutions. It is relatively safe and inexpensive but has been associated with high rates of peritoneal glucose absorption leading to problems with hypertriglyceridemia, hyperglycemia, and long-term peritoneal membrane dysfunction. One thing that's different about hemodialysis from peritoneal dialysis is peritoneal dialysis, um, the membrane itself, the peritoneal membrane, is permeable to plasma proteins, amino acid, and polypeptides. These substances are lost in the diacylate fluid. So therefore, the amount of loss is usually um, 
about 0.5 grams per liter of diosylate drainage, but it can be high as 10 to 20 grams per day of protein loss. This loss may increase to as much as 40 grams per day during episodes of peritonitis as the peritoneal membrane becomes more permeable. So these patients might actually need more additional protein in their diet secondary to this protein loss. Here's a picture of a a uh, patient who is using peritoneal dialysis in her sleep in the comfort of her home. Here's a picture that kind of depicts how peritoneal dialysis works uh, with the peritoneal cavity. You can see the di dialysis solution is higher and the drainage bag is lower. Complications of perite uh, peritoneal dialysis is exit site infection, peritonitis, hernias, lower back problems, bleeding, pulmonary complications, and usually pulmonary complications because of that large amount of fluid uh, of diosylate that's actually you know, impinging on that thoracic cavity when it's drained into that. And then obviously protein loss we talked about. Effectiveness of dialysis, um, we look at both of these. There's some pros and cons, but in and all, hemodialysis relieves some of the symptoms that are associated with end-stage kidney disease. It delays cardiovascular complications. It's able to manage the fluid and electrolyte disturbances and remove some of those uremic toxins. Peritoneal dialysis has the same benefits of hemodialysis, but it also includes having some positive effects on having control and self-care within your own schedule, creating that independence lower costs of peritoneal dialysis and you can do it in the comfort of your home and it's relatively simple. Continuous renal therapy or continuous renal replacement therapy or CRRT is an alternative method for treating acute kidney injury. It's contraindicated in a patient who has life-threatening hyperkalemia or pericarditis that requires rapid resolution but it can also be used in conjunction with hemodialysis if needed. A double lumen catheter is placed in the jugular femoral vein and is used to provide a 24-hour filtration. Differences of CRRT and hemodialysis is that CRRT is continuous rather than intermittent. There's large volumes of fluid that can be removed over days, 24 hours to, to weeks versus uh, in hemodialysis. Usually it lasts around three or four hours. Solute is, re is the removal can occur by convection, so there's no diacylate required for CRRT in addition to osmosis and diffusion. Less hemodynamic instability, so there's less hypotension with CRRT than there is with hemodialysis. It does not require a hemodialysis nurse to actually start it, but it does require an ICU nurse who's been educated on the C CRRT machine. It's less complicated equipment than hemodialysis. So the most time that you're going to see CRRT is in the ICU for patients who have some sort of acute kidney injury. Patient teaching for living with CKD is monitor their weight. If they have weight gain, they need to notify their physician because, again, that fluid volume overload is going to have an impact on many different body systems. Vital signs. Uh, will need to be measured and um, urinary output at home will need to be measured. Fluid and dietary restrictions include a low sodium diet, low potassium, low phosphorus, and low protein. Again, knowing those particular um, foods that are associated with potassium and phosphorus is important. Usually when I think of potassium, I think of uh, fruits and vegetables. So specific fruits and vegetables that are higher in potassium levels should be avoided. And then when I think of phosphorus foods, I think of protein or dairy products. Uh, we need to monitor symptoms of uremia, uh, strategies to avoid thirst like frequent mouthwash, sugarless hard candy, using ice chips instead of liquids or, or spray bottle in the mouth. Avoid nephrotoxic medications that will just further increase kidney damage like NSAIDs, some antibiotics, contrast dye, and heavy metals. And then lastly, we want to help those people by providing support group or counseling for patients who are um, on hemodialysis and potentially waiting for a kidney transplant. If patients do have a kidney transplant, it's really treated um, like a post-operative care and we look for types of complications. Patients that are on kidney uh, transplant list could be there for years waiting for a particular match. 
So when they do get a kidney transplant, we want to monitor renal function to assess for further impairment. Usually those patients, if the kidney uh, holds and they receive the kidney well, you should no have normalized creatinine levels um, over time. We need to monitor hematocrit levels and pain control monitor fluid and electrolytes like hyponatremia and hypokalemia, secondary to a diuresis. Those patients that do get new kidneys will, um, because of the inflammatory process of the actual surgery itself, and the new kidney starts working, they will diurese large volumes of urine. So, so any sort of sudden decrease in urinary output is a cause for concern because we want to see large volumes because um, that means the kidney is perfusing and functioning. We could look for any sort of clot that might be obstructing kidney, um, the kidneys from working, but ultimately the physician needs to be called if there's a sudden decrease in urinary output. Complications post um, procedure long term are rejection of the organ itself. These patients will be on um, immunosuppression therapy for, for a lifetime. Infection, um, because they are on immunosuppressives, that puts them at greater risk. Cardiovascular disease is higher among those patients with a kidney transplant, so we're looking for a hypertension, um, dyslipidemia, diabetes, smoking, rejection, infection, increased homocysteine levels, uh, all kind of fall under the cardiovascular care of patients post um, renal transplant. They also have a higher incidence of cancer um, in kidney transplant, so um, we want to watch out for that. And then ultimately those patients could have a failure of the new kidney over time depending on a potential cause. Here's a picture of the kidney transplant. Sometimes they leave the old kidney in and uh, sometimes they don't. It just depends on how well they can fit the new kidney in onto the body cavity. So again, when the patients do get a kidney transplant, we want to look for urinary output and normalizing creatinine levels. That concludes our discussion on chronic kidney disease.